I said that at practice not too long ago, and they just, they just looked at me like, Memorex? What, what is Memorex? <laughs> okay. Back in the mid-90s, Time Magazine predicted that the Internet will change how we see God. And in that article of Professor of Religion, he said, we're going to start seeing God as a process evolving with us. And he says, quote, if you believe in an eternal, unchanging God, you'll be in trouble. Well, it's been exactly 25 years now since that article, and we do. Our society thinks we need a, a newer model of God, one that fits our social views and current political views. He's got to be high in grace, He's got to be low in wrath, and while you're at it, just throw in a little extra helping of love. Most people, and I mean most Christians and most non-Christians, tend to see God as this cosmic teddy bear. He's big, warm, and fluffy, and soft, and he's full of infinite love and infinite forgiveness. He couldn't hurt a fly, and he certainly wouldn't condemn anyone made in his image. And on a day of judgment, God's simply going to give everybody a big group hug and just sort of wink at sin. Now, there's only one problem with what I just described. It's not in your Bible. Your Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Last week we started a message on the love and wrath of God. Love was easy. Everybody loves love. But now when is the last time you heard a message on the wrath of God? Especially on Father's Day. Which may not be that inappropriate. Fathers, let me tell you today about the wrath of God. There's always been a tension between the grace of God and the wrath of God. And it goes way back, way back. Second century, uh, around the year 144 A.D., there was a false teaching developed by a guy named Marcion. Now, he was the son of a Christian preacher, and i got to tell you, Preacher's kids always come up with strange ideas, okay? Marcion came up with this idea that says, all the world is evil. All matter is evil. And if the world by its very nature is evil, it could not have been created by a good, perfect God. So Marcion came up with his own solution. He believed the God of the Old Testament was a different God than the God of the New Testament. The Old Testament God was named Jehovah, and he was jealous, and he was wrathful. He was unpredictable. He was vindictive. And Jehovah, being a very, very imperfect God, made a very imperfect world and filled it, either intentionally or as a joke or who knows why, with imperfect human beings. Now, on the other hand, Marcion believed that the God of the New Testament was the perfect God. He was a God of grace and love, and he sent Jesus to help fix the world, get it out of this mess that this other God had created. Marcion believed there'd be no final judgment, because the God of the New Testament was too loving and too forgiving to ever judge. Doesn't that sound just like what I just read at the beginning? It's got a modern ring to it. How did Marcion get rid of all those scripture verses? How did he get such a huge crowd following him? Well, number one, he rewrote the Bible, threw the Old Testament completely away, threw everything in the New Testament away except for the books that Luke and Paul wrote. And if there was a single verse in those books that he didn't like, he threw that away said somebody else wrote that, which is incredibly modern in today's academic culture to say something like that. So you say, well, what's the truth? How does it fit together? Let me say it like this. In your Bible, when you see the word wrath, 
80% of the time, you'll find that word will be in your Old Testament. But 20% of the time, you'll see the word grace in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, you'll see the word grace 80% of the time, but you'll still also see wrath 20% of the time. It's in both Testaments. Don't throw away your Old Testament thinking it's something different. God's wrath is seen in the Old and in the New, and God's grace is seen in the Old and in the New. So how can the Bible be true if it calls it one place He's a God of grace, and in another place He's a God of wrath? <clears throat> has to do with another one of those qualities of God that we haven't talked about a lot. Holiness. God cannot sin, and He cannot tolerate holiness. Look what they say even in the Old Testament. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet He does not leave the guilty unpunished. The Bible says God has to deal with sin, and there's two ways that God deals with sin. The first way is by grace, and the second way is by wrath. Now you already know this. You, I, you have heard it from me and many other pastors. You can see it in Jesus. The first time Jesus came, He came in grace. He came in humility. He came in a, a manger. But when He comes again, He's going to come in power. I mean, from our study in Revelation, remember these verses? I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice He judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on His head are many crowns. He has a name written on Him that no one knows but Himself. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood. And his name's the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword, with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. We like that when we study Revelation, but does that make God a cold-hearted, vindictive monster today? Oh, absolutely not. On the contrary, it points His holiness. It shows His goodness. Because how could a good and righteous God ignore evil and allow it to go unpunished? God's wrath against evil is just a, uh, an illustration of His holiness and righteousness. Now, if you're a biblical Christian, and I mean a Christian who follows the Bible as the Word of God, you're going to have to deal with the fact that God is a God of grace, and God is also a God of wrath. Now, I will be the very first one to tell you that in the past, some preachers have gone just a little bit too far with the wrath of God thing. Some of you may have studied Jonathan Edwards in school, talking about the early 1700s. This guy's smart. He enters jail at age 12, and he becomes a preacher. And his most famous sermon that he just delivers from city to city to city, he's got it all memorized, or sinners in the hands of an angry God. I'm just going to read. Now, this is not scripture. This is part of his sermon. I just want you to see, get a little taste of what they sounded like back in the 1700s. The God who holds you over the pit of hell, much as the one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, he abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is of purer eyes than you to bear to have you in his sight. You are 10,000 times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful and venomous serpent is in ours. You have offended him infinitely more than ever a stubborn rebel did, his prince. And yet it is nothing but his hand that holds you from falling into the fire every moment. Wow. Invite that guy to your next dinner party. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, he'd be a real blessing. Now, in all honesty, he was a good pastor. He really was, but he just kind of, kind of got into the wrath part a little strong. Now, confession time. I grew up in a Christian church, Church of Christ, like we are, uh, but it was a kind of a different flavor. I, I heard a lot, a lot of sermons about what's wrong with everybody else and the, the wrath of God. And they were very less articulate. They involved a lot more screaming and yelling and slamming. We had one preacher whose his keystone, whenever he was really getting worked up, would be he'd slam his Bible down. You know, that big old pulpit back in those days, had plenty of room. And he would just slam it there to make a point. And I, I remember one revival. He slammed it there, but caught the edge. And it, it careened right over to the communion table. And by some strange miracle, caught the edge of the communion table and nearly took out Aunt Susie on the second row. It was <laughs> rather humorous. Uh, but no, I can, I can totally understand if some of you have problems with the wrath of God. So real quick now, it's not the sermon, but real quick, I just want to show you, Tom, keep up with me. How do we know the wrath of God's in the New Testament? Let me just read you some verses. You already know John 3, 16. Well, this is from a couple verses later. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. From Ephesians, let no one deceive you with empty words, because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Uh, from Thessalonians, these they displease God and are hostile to everything in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that to be saved. In this way, they're always heaping up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. Colossians says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Because of, of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when His righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what He's done. And again from Romans, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth. Now that's only a handful of verses. But like I say, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, you got to know what you're going to do with them. And so here's my remarks and thoughts about that. And they're kind of brief. Three things. We all need to understand that God's wrath is motivated by His perfect justice. And this is one of the first incredibly important things we got to say today. God's wrath is not human wrath. It is completely unfair to take an example of human wrath and to think God works that way. Because what do we think of when we hear the word wrath? We see a drunken father coming home to beat his children, and the children running and hiding because he's full of wrath. And even in the movies, the old Star, Star Trek movie, The Wrath of Khan, Khan feels he has been mistreated. He's angry. He wants revenge. He wants payback. He is out of his mind crazy in wrath. That's not the way God works, and that's not the way wrath works. God is not so angry that he's crazy out of his mind. And when you hear the phrase wrath of God, you've got to stop thinking like human wrath. From God's point of view, God's wrath is the way a divine God would answer and deal with sin and evil. See, a God who allows sin and evil to continue really isn't a very fair, loving, and just God. And as much as I know you would rather hear sermons on the love of God, do you want a God who does the right thing? or not. We admire people because they stand for the truth. They stand up for the right. 
And so when we look to God, why wouldn't we be pleased with a God who is fair and justice, real justice to the world? That's number one. God's wrath is motivated by His judgment, and it's not human wrath. Don't even think of it like that. And number two, God's wrath is restrained by His incredible patience. Not a lot to say here. With us, wrath is like, oh no, I'm going angry, I'm going to go off. I'm going to lose control, I'm going to lose my rationality. God doesn't work that way. In fact, right now, God's wrath is put on hold. That's point number two, very simple. You're not seeing God's wrath because He's waiting. He's got a reason why He's waiting. I'll tell you about that in number three. Number three, God's wrath must be understood in light of His eternal purpose. God is not in heaven losing it, jumping up and down, screaming and cursing about how He's going to get even, get revenge. His wrath is actually put on hold right now because He wants all people to come to repentance. Martin Luther said this, he said, if I were God and the world treated me the way it treated him, I'd kick the wretched thing to pieces. Which makes me really glad that Martin Luther wasn't God. Because right now God is holding it all in. In his patience, he's waiting. You want to really fully understand the love of God? That's it. He's holding it in. He's holding his righteousness in to give you a chance to get it together. You really think grace is good and grace is important? I'm going to tell you that totally redefines the power of grace. When we talk about grace, I have a point to give you on this one. We usually think about the story of the prodigal son. You know, the young man demands his inheritance, leaves for a foreign country, spends all of his dad's money, and finally comes home. And then we see the father lovingly waiting there for him. And we say, wow, wonderful grace of God. But I want to give you a point that maybe you've not heard before. If the son hadn't come home, he would never have been reunited with the father. And the son had never come home. He would still be in a distant country, you know, among the pigs. In the story of the prodigal son, God's grace is, is shown to be there and, and readily available to any and everybody. The father was ready and willing to forgive the son, but the son had to come home. If he had stayed away from home, he would have never been restored to family. I think that's critical because you know how we think. Sometimes we think, oh, grace happens automatically. God forgives me all the time. There's nothing I have to do with it. It doesn't matter what I do. God just loves me so, so much because He's my cosmic teddy bear. And the truth is, God's love and God's wrath are two sides of one characteristic. God has to deal with sin. He would much rather do it through grace. But ultimately, there will be wrath. Who is the number one speaker about wrath in the New Testament, you ask? It's called the Apostle Paul. Well, then who is the number one speaker in the New Testament about grace? And it's the Apostle Paul. The same man speaks of both. I want to give you just a, a flavor of his conversion. You can read it with me on screen. This is just Paul sharing his life. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who's given me strength that He considers me faithful, appointing me to His service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, 
so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Paul, in a very eloquent way, is simply saying, if I can be saved, anybody can be saved. The last verse, and praise team, come on down. The last verse says, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm telling you that if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and have accepted Him in His grace, then you don't need to worry a minute about God's wrath because sin for you has been dealt with. But if you're still waiting, if you're still wondering, if you still have yet to pull the trigger or to start the race, you just need to consider all that. Would you stand as we share one final song this morning?